guys, welcome to the Raising Killen podcast. My name is Marsh Naidu and I blog at RaisingKillen.org where we curate resources for parents raising children with developmental delay and or disabilities. For those of you who are new to us, welcome. This podcast and blog started off as a passion project in 2019. As a mom and a physical therapist, I wanted to share the resources that I found beneficial in raising my son, Kellen. As always, remember the information provided here is purely educational. And if you are seeking advice for your specific situation, to always contact a trained professional. In today's episode number 70, you're going to get to meet Ashley Barlow, who hosts the Special Education Advocacy Podcast. Ashley brings to the table her unique skill set. So guys, grab that cup of coffee, put your legs up and relax and get ready for some awesome conversation. How are you? I'm excellent. Ashley, thank you for joining me today. First off, I want to let you know that you are my to-go resource as far as IEP plans are concerned and just the uh, unique skill set you bring to the table in terms of being a mom, being a teacher, as well as your legal skill set. You've helped me tremendously in my journey. So welcome to the Raising Killen podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm happy that um, it can be helpful that you're getting good information and that you um, feel supported. So that's always, that's good feedback to get. (laughs) Uh, To get things um, started off, would you kindly introduce yourself? Sure. So uh, my name is Ashley Barlow. I am a special education attorney. I'm licensed in Kentucky and Ohio. I um, have a law practice here that I work with my dad. I started off as a general practitioner. And several years ago, um, I decided to kind of shift my focus to special education representation. So at the moment, um, and probably henceforth, I do um, special education work, I do special needs estate planning work, and I do a little bit of divorce work still, mostly as an expert witness in cases with kids with disabilities. Um, About 85% of my work is in special education. I used to be a teacher. I taught German before I went to law school. Um, and then um, I also am the parent of a little guy that has Down syndrome. My son, Jack, is 11, getting close to 12. Um, and I have another son, Griffin, who is 15. Um, and yeah, so that's what we do. I started Ashley Barlow Company. Um, as a second business in 2020, because everybody starts businesses in pandemics, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, I really, um, the beginning of the business model was really for me to kind of figure out like a marketing thing for my law firm. And then it grew into fulfilling a need that I saw as really important. So, What we do is we provide free and remarkably reasonably priced resources to parents and to anybody that sits at the IEP table. Um, And the reason that we do that is because parents, parent involvement is really, really important. It is um, stressed in the federal law. It is stressed in guidance documents and time and time again, I was getting cases where parents would say, I don't know where to start. I don't know what resources are out there. And so I thought I need to get more information in parents' hands in a way that's accessible to them. And, you know, even though uh, we we might be well-versed in idea, the translation of law into an IEP is not always as easy as it may seem. Ashley, um, I'm not sure how what's your, uh, the emotions surrounding the IEP for you may have been, but for me, it is a, no matter how well-versed you feel, 
how together you may feel on certain aspects. There's always that feeling like you are facing uh, a battle for your child. Talk to me about that, Ashley. How, how can parents be better equipped? Is it possible at all, in your opinion, to kind of lessen some of that emotion going into an IEP meeting? Or is that just like a sympathetic response? Um, what are your thoughts about it? I think that's a really good question. And really, that's one of the reasons that I started Ashley Barlow Company. Um, So, you know, what I think the real kind of answer to that is lies in marrying the objective framework of the law and the research and the teaching strategy and the content, like the actual stuff of special education with the subjectivity the parents feel. So my journey as a parent in special education started horrendously. My preschool experience was awful. My son's preschool experience was awful. Thank God, very few people from that experience still um, are employed by our district, but it was awful. And I felt like I didn't want to advocate because I could have, you know, 20 more years of advocacy in our little school district. And why am I going to fight for preschool? And I truly wish that I had reframed um, my mentality about that because it was ineffective and it started us off poorly. Um, And what it did was it yielded a really stressful and awful kindergarten transition. And so through my own experience and then in helping probably close to hundreds of clients. I'm I'm over a hundred and probably close to hundreds of clients. What I've realized is that we need to keep that empathy. We need to keep the subjectivity that we bring as bring in as parents. Parents are experts on their children, but they also bring a really important amount of emotion to the IEP table. And listen, Congress wrote the word parent 450 times in the law. If one thing is clear in idea, it is that Congress wants parents to be involved. But there's also this onus that is very important to know special education, to know the law, to know um, the mechanics, how to progress monitor, how to read evaluations. So if there's one tip that I can give to parents, you already have that subjective stuff done, but really learn the objective information, learn the law and learn the content. Ashley, what resources would you recommend for parents wanting to find out more about special education? Yeah, I think that I think, you know, it's just like we do in education. You have to learn the way that you like to learn. So I learned by reading books. I went to a bunch of um, colleges here in the greater Cincinnati area. Then I begged, barred and pleaded to buy books on special education practice and special education law. It's very difficult, surprisingly difficult to get those if you aren't enrolled for classes. I think because like if there's 18 kids in the class, they buy 18 books and I took number 18. But I was like, well, surely somebody won't buy the book. (laughs) And so I got them. So I learned by reading and then I outlined everything. Um, At Ashley Barlow Company, I have two online courses and online courses are a way that people are starting to or people are really learning. You know, there's that whole website masterclass. And so I have a course that is start to finish nuts and bolts special education law with a lot of advocacy tips infused in it, how to keep your binder, what that, what that crazy binder is, how to progress monitor, what to communicate to school from the parent's perspective, that kind of stuff. But it also goes through eligibility and evaluations and parts of the IEP and what due process looks like and those things. Um, So, you know, there's plenty of books out there. I always tell people just Google it and hop on Amazon, find the book that kind of speaks to you. Um, There are online courses like mine. There's plenty of blogs. There's rights law. So rights law is W-R-I-G-H-T-S-L-A-W. Pete Wright tried um, the Shannon Carter case before the United States Supreme Court. And he then developed this beast, this really valuable resource of rights law. So he has lots of books um, and he has a website. And I think the most 
cool thing about the website is in the top right corner, there's a search bar. So if you have a question, if something arises, maybe it's least restrictive environment, maybe it's behavior supports, maybe it's what is a functional behavioral assessment, um, you can type that into the search bar and you're going to find just a wealth of resources. Any article that's on rights law on that topic will come up. And guys, again, Ashley's podcast is called the Special Education Advocacy with Ashley Barlow. What really speaks to me is the way you frame advocacy, um, where communication is seen as the primary strategy. And that when you go into the IEP meetings, it's not about what do I need to get. Specifically, it is about what needs to be done that's best for my child. Um, and so that is, that's been a big takeaway for me. And the other was being prepared by having a future planning statement, which was actually something that I had not considered prior to listening to the podcast. Are there any um, kind of tips or any message that you would want to give to a parent that's raising a child with a disability, just some words of encouragement, Ashley, as to um, how they can best prepare to, to navigate the, the course. So, I mean, I think that's a really good question. And um, the first thing that I think is really important, I think it's, a, I think you have an important question um, because this can feel um, incredibly overwhelming. You know, if you have a child with a specific learning disability like dyslexia, dysgraphia, um, or dyscalculia, something like that, it's sometimes even hard to understand that the law says that your child has a disability. That's, that's hard to understand, and it's hard to cope with. The diagnosis phase can be extremely stressful and extremely emotional. And um, then, you know, you have to find the balance between we are a family with a child with a disability and we are a family that still has the same values and interests that we had prior to the diagnosis. It's like, you know, before diagnosis and after, after diagnosis. diagnosis. And then you have this like big kind of during diagnosis um, emotional component. And um, then we also have to... Um, kind of fit in the rest of the things, right? I'm still a, a mom and a sister and a friend and an attorney and a, um, a surfer. I like to surf in the shallow end. Don't get too excited when I say a surfer, but you know, like the, the, the other things that we like, we still have to fit in. And then kind of like what happens particularly to people with my kind of personality with this type A um, driven by anxiety kind of personality is, we're always ruminating. We're always thinking about those disability specific things. For me, my son struggles with um, behavior quite a bit. He has ADHD, he has anxiety, he's extremely impulsive, um, and he's oftentimes dysregulated and he has a hard time knowing when he's dysregulated. And so I'm constantly thinking about how to keep him regulated and, and what behavior strategies might work and where we're going next. And, you know, what if this doesn't work and what's this going to look like when he's an adult? And before I know it, he's 65 and he's stuck in my basement. He hasn't left in, you know, a month and a half. And, and my mind just kind of goes there. And then I don't realize I'm doing it all the while I'm trying to practice law or I'm trying to just go to a concert with a girlfriend. And so I think being able to, put your special education experience in a specific spot to, to literally compartmentalize it is a really good strategy to dive in and to know it and to feel it and to live it. And then to be able to say, not today, disability, I've got these other things going on. Um, so, you know, <laughs> Treat it with respect, yes. but like any other thing in your life, any other obligation or emotional um, package that you're carrying, see if you can't um, treat it with the kind of respect that you also put it away for a second. Um, 
And that's much easier said than done. Other, you know, kind of, that's the philosophical answer, right? Like that's the self-care answer. But I think from a practical standpoint, what I preach at Ashley Barlow Company is communicate, communicate, communicate. So special education advocacy has to just become a way of life. And so, yes, you know, I say compartmentalize, but I also say just, it's just kind of part of what you do then, right? So I think particularly if your children are young and perhaps if your children developmentally require constant communication from you, I think you should communicate with your IEP team on a very regular basis. So maybe that's weekly. I've got, you know, a communication bundle on my website and I recommend this thing called a Sunday email. Um, I think you should communicate about progress monitoring. I think you should communicate about updates in medical um, history, medical experience, therapeutic experiences. Are we making progress in private speech or are we not? Have we started a new medication? I think you should communicate about experiences that the child has. How are we doing in soccer? Um, did we start golf? And do we like the new golf instructor? What does the new golf instructor have? What's the secret sauce that the golf instructor has that is um, helping with behavior supports? Could we maybe generalize the skills that we're learning in golf into the gen ed room or into um, physical therapy at school or something else? So our jobs as parents is... We are the general contractors of the adult life, the, the transition to adulthood and the actual adult life. And we have to plan that. And we also, of course, with our children, and we also are the general contractors of what happens at home and what happens in the community. So school does school and we do home and community. And all three of those kind of components have to come together in this beautiful Venn diagram <laughs> of life, right? Life is at, at our kids' ages, homeschool and community. And so if we can blend together by communicating what's happening at school, home and community, we're going to get a really great experience for our children. So I think, you know, Having a healthy connection and a healthy um, relationship with our advocacy is important, but I also think it just becomes a way of life. And once you get good at that communication piece and the kind of like general contracting piece, that just kind of becomes a rote thing that you do. So um, let, let's see. Some of the other questions that I, I had were related to the continuum of care as your child ages and you start to think about those transition years. And even though you as a parent may not necessarily want to face it or think about it, what happens to your child when you are not there? So what does that look like? Any advice to parents? Um, on that particular point, um, any pointers? Yeah, so I think evaluations are really important at that age. I think, you know, I have seen so many transition plans that only say, um, okay, so I get a lot of transitions for boys with autism. I don't know why, but uh, oh, probably 90% of them say that the child's goal is to work at a video game store, like GameStop. I mean, it's remarkable. Like you could almost say a hundred percent of them say that. And what's funny is a lot of my clients that, you know, have this in their transition plan would be horrendous at customer service. And the burden of customer service would be a really bad match for like an unhealthy match for the child. And so the parents come in and say, okay, somebody wants to return a game that my kid likes. My, my kid is going to jump all over them about how it's the best game in the universe. And why would you ever want to return it? And they'd start calling them bad words. And I'm like, right, because transition plans oftentimes are oddly too centered on the child's preference and not centered on the child's profile. So that's kind of good. I, I need to write that down. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. They, so we need good evaluation data. But a problem that happens is schools either don't own or don't have access or don't know about evaluations. And so oftentimes I'm saying to schools and meetings, where can we get better evaluations? 
Can we go to vocational rehabilitation? Can we go to social security? Can we go to the ARC or to some other um, agency that is going to provide job supports? Who else owns um, these tests and can give us information? There are also quite a few that are available for free that parents can do. There are profiles that you can do just Google, um, you know, adult employment um, evaluation disability or something like that. There are lots of them that parents can do to start to have the conversation with their children about jobs that might work or training that they might want to do or college experiences that they might want to have. Um, when I talk about transition, I talk about five areas of life. So I talk about independent living, employment, transportation, health advocacy, and social emotional health. And I think it's really important that you have good evaluation data on those things and that you're talking to your child and that you're thinking about those five areas of life now. I don't care if your child's three, you should start thinking about it now. Now, I can totally overwhelm people with this conversation in the context of estate planning. <laughs> oh, because I, I think this is amazing because honestly, we have to think about the continuum of care for our kids. It, it, it's not an option. It, it is a must. And this is what's going to ensure the success of their transition, Ashley. And I just want to give you the heads up. I'm actually in Tennessee and there is a state... Um, organization called the Tennessee Center for Supported Decision Making that has a tool on their website. So for a while, that was the only tool. Um, well, you had the only law for supported decision making. Last time I checked, Tennessee still was the only one, but I'm I'm fairly certain that a couple other have gotten approved because a couple others were pretty far through committee. Um, but Tennessee's supported decision making, we're talking about options um, that are alternatives to guardianship in case you aren't familiar with supported decision making. Um, Tennessee's is a really good model. Is I, my son's 12, almost 12, he's 11. Um, and as I start thinking about his transition, I realize, for example, we are residents of Kentucky. Kentucky's Medicaid waivers are really great. We got on a waiver when he was probably four or five. Um, and so we're stuck in Kentucky. We are stuck as Kentucky residents. And our waiver right now says that you can't leave the state of Kentucky for more than two months at a time. So what's that mean for our retirement? You know, as I look at Jack's independent living, I think that um, it, it probably matches our family's interests that we don't leave Jack for longer than three or four weeks, that we, you know, are, are close to him, whether he's living with us or he's living in a multifamily building that we buy with um, money that we've invested for his future, I don't think that he'll live in a group home right now. That doesn't seem to align with our family's um, interests and the resources that are available in our region. Um, so, you know, can we become residents of Florida? Probably not. And so I'm thinking about those things because it's going to take us years to figure out um, what that means for his employment, what that means for his health care. Another thing, my husband and I, my, my family has a house in Key West and my husband and I love Key West. But if we were to try to move to Key West, not only is it Florida, where right now there aren't great um, waiver benefits and there's like super long waiting lists, but also his health care would be three hours away in Miami or Fort Lauderdale. That doesn't seem feasible right now. Um, so, you know, we think about those things and that kind of helps us carve out our retirement plans and also the best plans for Jack. Another thing, I mean, and this is kind of unfortunate that we have to think about this right now, but where not only where are the resources good for our children, but um, how will our children be treated? You know, there's one city um, where my older son has had tournaments, basketball tournaments, baseball tournaments, that kind of thing. And I could not believe the way that people looked at Jack in this one city where we used to travel a couple times a year for tournaments. And I was like, 
I'm not taking him there again. We don't need to go near people that look at him like that. He can go lots of places where he is perfectly accepted and loved for who he is. And we don't need, I'm not going to, you know, set up a booth and start advocating for Down syndrome at a baseball tournament. So I'm just not going to go there. Um, And I'm certainly not going to relocate there and I'm not going to look for a job for him there. So, you know, this can spiral pretty quickly, but I think the secret is thinking about it now and thinking about those five areas of life. Um, So yeah, I could go on and on about transition. I had a client really shed a lot of light on me on the social emotional thing. So I'll say one more thing about this. My client wrote a future planning statement and she said she wanted for her child to be interested and interesting. And she thought that was the key to social emotional relationships with her grade school, middle school, and high school peers into adulthood. And this really struck a chord with me because we as special needs parents have um, a lot of perspective shifting experiences. You know, we really, I always say that my BS radar is really honed because, you know, I don't have time for fluff nonsense. I know if I like something, if I don't like something, if I want to dive into a relationship or I don't want to dive into a relationship, if that's for me, it's for me. And if it's not, it's not. End of story. And that's because I've had these experiences. And I don't, I find that I don't crave relationships that are nonsensical, that are fluffy. I'm like 75 layers into the onion right away. And if you think about it, as people age, everybody has experiences that make them deeper beings, that make them more critical thinkers, that make them more empathetic. You know, your parents might get ill. You you might bury parents. People lose jobs. People experience divorce. People have their own health crises. And all of these things make us more connected people. If we protect our children with disabilities such that they don't have those experiences that make them interesting, their friends aren't going to want to hang out with them. Yeah, sure, maybe they're refreshing to be around, but they aren't going to want to hang out with them because who wants to continue to talk about Disney movies when they're 25 years old? Now, you know, if somebody has experienced a hardship at work or if they are really involved in their own medical decision making and they're really um, and they've got stuff to say and that helps them to just become more empathetic and interesting friends, their friends are going to want to continue to hang out with them. But, you know, I think about when we were in our 20s and we had friends that were, um, you know, experiencing breakups when they were engaged, really emotional stuff or miscarriages or considering moving across the country for a promotion. Those were deep things. And I know that as we experience deep things, people that weren't having those same experiences or similar experiences were kind of off my radar because I was like, I don't have much in common with them right now. So we think it's really important that we continue to challenge our children into adulthood so that their relationships stay meaningful. That's life 101 right there. We can't shelter, nor should we, take away from the experiences that our kids could have uh, and potentially have as young adults. They need to get into that part of life. They need to be able to to make their own soup. Ashley, I I can't thank you enough for your pearls of wisdom and and definitely would uh, like to thank you for sharing your knowledge on your podcast again, which I find is an invaluable tool. And I, I know other parents would derive that benefit as well. And guys, this is just all free information and you know, it, it's what you do with it and what you take from it and, and how you implement it for your child moving forward. Um, are there any last words that you would like to leave us with, Ashley, as well as your contact information? Well, words of wisdom, um, you know, you're part of a really wonderful community. So if you found this Raising Kellen podcast, if you um, get 
interested in rights law, um, my stuff over at Ashley Barlow Co., like company, C-O-A-S-H-L-E-Y-B-A-R-L-O-W-C-O.com. Um, you will find a community and being a part of that community is very enriching. Um, and, you know, it does yield those deeper connections and relationships. So, um, yeah, there's stress. Yeah, there's a lot of beauty. Um, and I'm here for all of it. So welcome to the community. And I am happy to um, to get to know you virtually. Um, so, yeah, you can find all of that stuff on my website. And you can find the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. <laughs> Ashley, you have an amazing day. And again, Thank you for your hard work and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. As always, thank you for listening along on the Raising Kellen podcast. Uh, we sincerely appreciate your time. And if you could kindly leave us a rate and a review on your podcast player, we would appreciate that as well. Well, guys, until we see you all the next time, as always, remember get to the top of your mountain. This is Marsh Naidu signing off.